Well, innovation has always been a word of fancy that is used by the writers, innovators, technocrats, influencers, and many more. But the question is, what is the real innovation? And what is that education ecosystem is talking about? Our next session is all about innovation in education. Let's hear what the leading educators and tech experts and influencers are talking about in the session, Technology Innovation in Higher Education. Our next panelist, Ronak Singh, founder, University 18. Ronak is passionate about education, technology, entrepreneurship, and public policy, with his area of expertise being social impact entrepreneurship in the educational space and shaping public policy. As a social impact entrepreneur, he is a firm believer in using technology to provide equal opportunities to those less privileged. He runs an online education company that he founded, which provides higher education to working class people in 150 countries across the world, striving to provide people with equal opportunities, regardless of geography and socioeconomic demographics. Our next panelist, Nitesh Ruhadki, COO Imagine XP. Nitesh has around 1.5 decades of experience in sales, marketing, product operations, and program management. He worked in these domains across various industries such as EdTech, Telecom, uh, with Bharti Airtel and Virgin Mobile and Reliance Communications, Mobile VAS, OTT Digital with Angama Digital. Presently, he's working with the EdTech organization Imagine XP with major focus on developing and growing their sales and marketing prowess. Involved in end to end organization machinery from product development to after sales, as he believes in enabling and managing the complete value chain. We also have with us Narayan Mahadev, founder Bridge Labs, a serial entrepreneur with around three decades of experience in U.S. energy leadership roles. Narayan Mahadevan is the founder of Bridge Labs, an employability platform for high tech skilling and 100% employment guaranteed. Bridge Labs has developed a unique ML AI driven approach to custom skill as per job seekers capability and employer mandates to achieve 100% job placement. Narayan oversees the overall operations and functions of the company. With the inception of Bridge Labs in 2016, Narayan's main aim has been to use his and the team's technological expertise to bridge the employability and skills gap in the emerging tech space. He envisions Bridge Labs to be synonymous with employability within the next five years. By 2025, he would like Bridge Labs to have impacted more than 1 million jobs in India. This panel discussion will be moderated by Gajendra Padhyay, editor, voice and data. Gajendra has been in senior management roles in the telecom and IT industries between 1997 and 2012 and worked with companies like Idea Cellular, Vodafone and Reliance Infocom in the past. He has handled large projects in the mobile industry, which includes interconnection frameworks and implementation of mobile number portability in 2011. He was the India and SARC business head for Affilias, a global top-level domain, TLD platform and technology service provider handling the back-end technology platform for .in country code and the .org domain. He is currently advising several startups on business strategy and industry partnerships in the IoT, AI and healthcare tech space. Over to you, Gajendra. Welcome to this DataQuest Higher Education Conference and Awards. The theme of this session is technology innovation in higher education, right? Today we have a stellar panel of people and uh, from, from the education industry, some of the brightest minds. I welcome you all to this session. We will keep our uh, discussions focused on the need for innovation in uh, higher education. And I will let the panelists start with, uh, with their thoughts on what is the crying need today for innovation in, uh, and use of technology in higher education. So I, I would I'd request Dr. JV Desai to start the session with his initial thoughts, and we'll go down the panel list and then move to the actual questions. OK, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Desai, uh, presently working as a vice chancellor of AMN University in Haryana. 
I'm working in this post in six years. And uh, since uh, my days from IIT Bombay, uh, I am into machine learning only. And all my research is in uh, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. Today, I have an opportunity to talk to the people regarding the, the technology innovations in higher education. So as guys, you all very well aware, the innovation part is, of course, the technology innovation part came into existence more in uh, during uh, a pandemic time. Uh, and uh, I was a part of uh, so many online conferences, online webinars, and online teaching, and also administering all the online classes in the university. So during that time, we faced so many challenges. People talk of opportunities and the challenges. But here, uh, to be very frank, to share my uh, views on this kind of uh, uh, online courses we conducted, we, we had many more challenges from the student side than from the university side. Of course, university connectivity is always better with so many leisure lines and all that. But being from the rural area here, and it is around 50 kilometers from Faridabad. Uh, of course, it comes in NCR, but still NCR has got so many problems as far as the connectivity is concerned. And the IT infra is, and the laptops and the smartphones, the student carry a lot of challenges for that. And then uh, somehow we moved on and uh, we, we went up to the examinations and all that we did it, but still the challenges remain challenges as far as the IT infra is concerned. And moreover, uh, some of the opportunities uh, parties, uh, we, we took time as there were uh, more students in the campus and we took time to develop our own content uh, on the YouTube. And there again, we faced challenges when we made our YouTube for pharmacy. Pharmacy department took a lot of initiatives in developing uh, the content uh, for the practicals as well as the theory classes. Of course, uh, when we made the contents in English, there were a lot of many problems and then we switched over to a vernacular side and in Hindi and a lot of pickups were there and within a month we could reach around 5,000 subscribers. So one part I wanted to share, when we talk of online courses, naturally we come across Coursera, IDEX and all that. And there are a lot many courses to count up to 3,500, 4,000 courses are there. But whether our Indian student community is ready to accept it, whether our Indian students are uh, able to grasp their, their accent and their cope up with their speeds and all that. So in that connection, I had a varied opinions from my student community. And sometimes we, we, I, I, there is no point, uh, there is no, nothing wrong in accepting that we, we failed to motivate our students to go for uh, global learning platforms like uh, Coursera and all that. So in that connection, uh, I would uh, say we, we need to work a lot to develop uh, by, by our Indian teachers only so that students will be motivated to uh, take up such courses in future. Uh, <clears throat> this is my small uh, opinion about uh, the online courses. Thank you, Dr. Desai. Uh, I would request Dr. Ronak Singh uh, allow earlier to share his initial thoughts on innovation in ed higher education. Thank you and uh, good afternoon all, uh, all those on the panel as well as all those watching. I would actually like to thank Dr. Desai for pointing out some of the bits that uh, he did in his uh, initial brief uh, talk. I personally feel that COVID pandemic has been an accelerator like none other, probably since the Second World War, that has seen industry as well as governments adopt technology and te technical solutions that were already out there and developed uh, at a pace that has been unmatched so far. So if you, I think the joke goes that if you asked around whether it was a CEO, CEO or the CIO who uh, promoted your uh, uh, organization's technical adoption, or was it the other, the third C, which is COVID? 99% uh, of the people polled say COVID. So uh, that apart, we have 
past couple of years seen institutions, universities, organizations, such as our own workplaces as well, adopt the, uh, let's say the new normal, which, what that's been called. At a pace, of course, that's forced, but now it's here to stay. Uh, those who live in the Delhi NCR region also are painfully aware of uh, the other aspects under which it can be adopted, for instance, pollution and smog. But uh, having said that, if you went back to our nation's uh, history of having developed technology or adopted it, right from ISRO or ERNET, as the earlier networks were called, that we had access to uh, as academic institutions, but the retail or the public did not, down to the development and the uh, proliferation of telecom networks and now to online programs via SWAM and other platforms and the adoption of online courses and programs. The intent has been first to provide access, then second to connect and third to empower. Frankly, uh, for whatever it's worth, the year and a half that we saw, probably the one silver lining that I did see was the way the nation came together and people came together to pick up whatever tech that they could have access to, whether it's uh, Google Meet, Zoom, WebEx, or Swayam, or other platforms that are available out there, and create uh, what I'd like to call are the seeds of what may one day become One Nation, One Campus, where teachers are delivering lectures or classes from one part of the country, and students are anywhere else and studying from their homes or their offices or wherever they can get access to a laptop and decent broadband from. I personally also feel that it's laid the groundwork for a few other things that the government, frankly, has already envisioned going back almost a decade now. Uh, for instance, the Meta University concept, which will allow us to tap into the resources that are available across this diverse nation of us, get the professors online, and have students, so students sitting in, let's say, Tirunel Valley could be learning from a teacher teaching from Nehu in uh, the East, Northeast. So uh, that concept, which was again documented, in fact, if you looked it up, uh, almost a decade from now, ago from now, uh, could very soon become a reality, probably because of the fact that we had this one brief period of uh, accelerated technology adoption, and that's allowed both institutions as well as students to see what else is possible using the internet and uh, the tech that is available out there. We had uh, initial hiccups, I agree. Dr. Desai also pointed out some of them. There isn't enough, nearly enough content out there available in vernacular. But I believe given the ingenuity of the people out there, the faculty, the staff, the students, it won't be long before we see all, all those gaps being addressed faculty members, if encouraged and incentivized in the right manner, would be more than happy to work on courses in their own native languages. And of course, students, if assured that these courses are accepted and certified or are the kind that will make them eligible for credit award from the universities or institutions that are offering them, would be more than happy to take them. As far as the access to broadband or bandwidth is concerned. I'm sure the industry is doing enough and more than enough on a daily basis to address that. So uh, to sum it up, I feel this summit or this conference that we're having today is probably very well timed, considering what the country has gone through the past year and a half. I'm not going to talk about the ugly. The good is that we have uh, had this one and a half year of an intense boot camp mode of technology adoption all across educational institutions in our country. Thank you, Ronakji. So that was a great input uh, for me to move to the next speaker. I will uh, request Mr. Rajesh Kumar, who is actually a veteran of the telecom industry, who has spent many years in the IT sector and the telecom sector, actually building networks and setting up this infrastructure over which we are delivering these uh, courses to uh, you know students during this uh, lockdown and the pandemic. Uh, Dr. Rajesh Kumar, uh, I would request you to kindly throw some light because while your uh, uh, understanding of the education sector uh, will be uh, very high based on the technology and the transformational strategies that some of these educational inst institutions are adopting. It will be great to hear some thoughts from you on this. 
thank you thank you so much uh, and uh, good afternoon everyone uh, the, what i heard uh, from the extreme panelists is right right because when we look at today the campus the educational institutions the higher educational institutions they are like a complex enterprise with a diversity of stakeholders right there are students faculty staff it management everyone are there and today because of pandemic what we have seen from the last two years every uh, student every faculty is online that means they are into a connected world correct so because of the online courses they now are into a connected world and also if you look at the access what they get because of they are on the online and also self phase of studying right and uh, using chats for asking questions what we have seen today is it completely changed for the last two years the way the students have interacted with the faculty or the way the students used to access the content which are available right so today that has changed completely and if you look at the innovations what they are coming in from the educational perspective is that and what we are seeing from as a oem as a technology provider to the educational the institutions we are also seeing that the students coming back to the campus right one is it was a pandemic they had an online education online courses everything was online and today they want to come back to the campus and they want to have the same experience in place right there may be some issues at the rural area which there are a lot of projects which are coming up like bharatnet and all that where they are trying to provide a lot of bandwidth to the users at the end uh, villages and panchayats to that level of rural area but what i'm saying is when they are coming back there is a lot of experience which needs to be taken care of. as one of the panelists talked about access connect and empower what we say from our side is access connect and pro experience now everyone wants an experience right the user experience is very critical and the second point what we have seen is the seamless hybrid education which is coming into play that was very well articulated by one of the panelists saying that why can't a teacher sitting in somewhere in tirunelveli taking a class and a bangalore student able to view and get to that class and hear that session right so if we can build a knowledge network in india where any university any college can hook up onto that network right and then have this capability anywhere everywhere kind of a concept for educational services any teacher can start a session and any student can join that session at any time anywhere right and also that content instead of having the 3000 4000 content which is very difficult for them to understand can be stored in a data center and we can create like a cloud for the education for india and self paced learning of the students can happen that means they can look at those content those sessions at whatever time they want and have a self paced learning and can chat with the lecturers to get some of the questions what to be clarified right so from the innovation point of view from juniper what we are talking about is experience first networking that is to say that seamless hybrid uh, education what is very important and well being of people who are coming back to the campus because of the covid situation we they need to take care quality of education work environment facilities management right there are a lot of things which today the universities are looking at so there is a lot of refresh of the networks happening in the universities to cope up with this coming back as well as online with and one key thing as a oem i want to mention here is the security because security also plays a key role because there is so much of content and there is so much of uh, applications and research papers everything going into this so the security also plays a key important role so educational institutions also have to look at the security part very important because just not giving the connectivity just not providing the experience and making them online or bringing them in a hybrid situation but also looking at the security perspective so we uh, so all this is driven today with juniper solution known as ai driven and ml so all this is possible all this what i am talking about is possible using ai and ml kind of concepts what we are using so that there are a lot of things which we can look at as a use cases for the educational institutions and also moving further uh, what we are talking about is uh, even if it is virtual right even if it is virtual then why not anywhere everywhere kind of a concept so thank you so much thanks thank you dr rajesh kumar so you know that sets the context again for the next team because uh, while we have been talking about the infrastructure to deliver online education so far you are actually talking of on campus infrastructure and uh, getting students back to learning within the campus 
So, and that's a great thought. Uh, we have amongst us two people who are actually from within the industry and who are really making a difference by use of technology to deliver actually an upgrade skills of students. And uh, I would request Nitesh Rohatgi to share some of his thoughts. I will come to the actual content of what you are doing uh, in terms of uh, what Imagine XP is doing. But it will be great to hear your initial thoughts uh, on what the pandemic has done and how, how you have addressed the situation for students. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks to DataQuest for organizing this discussion and being part of such a repeated panel. So uh, uh, I carry an overall experience of 18 years and come from a telecom background as well. Currently, I'm working as a chief operating officer at Imagine XP. So Imagine XP is a higher education organization into future skill degree programs and for credit certification programs for the universities and colleges. So uh, we are currently associated with almost 30 plus universities and we are delivering future skill programs like a Bachelor of Design in User Experience, like a Master of Design in User Experience, a beta computer science in robotic process automation. So what we held up, our primary vision is to uh, bridge the employability gap. What is happening off late that industry is asking for Apple and we are providing oranges, right? So we wanted to uh, reduce down this mismatch and that's why uh, we are creating curriculums we are creating such degree programs and we are running all these programs in embedded degree format. We partnered with the university as a knowledge partner and very, when we complete, uh, we take on the entire execution of the program. So while doing that, uh, and even, uh, when the pandemic came in uh, almost one and a half to two years back, this uh, disrupted the entire education. Uh, learners, uh, primarily students and parents, uh, we, uh, we, uh, I'm also a parent and we also went through that journey. Always in a mindset we had that is always physical classroom learning, right? But pandemic has given a push and the mindset has, uh, has changed that online learning is also possible. But when I uh, uh, think from a student perspective, the charm of a campus life, a hostel life, like that cannot be taken away completely, right? From a, especially from a higher education perspective. So uh, this new education policy has also given a boost wherein 40% of academic curriculum can be delivered online. That has come in as a very uh, great boost for all the edtech players. Having said that, because uh, see, it's very, very important to bring in the variety of faculties and, co and coaches for the students so that they actually get the flavor of what is actually happening, what is required by the students to learn as a part of their learning curve. So this gives us the opportunity to deliver 40% cu curriculum. So Imagine XP currently has almost 1250 plus corporate co coaches. And when we design a curriculum, so we always focus, it's a mix of design, technology and business because in the current era of digital transformation for all the fresh talent pool coming out in the market, it's very important to build that digital skill set and digital skill set comprises of all the three parameters from a technology aspect as well, from a business uh, human aspect as well and from our design aspect as well. Right. So that's how we curated these curriculums. And with the access of NAP policy, we are now able to bring in almost all the mentors and faculties across the globe to the Indian students in higher education. So which is a very, very important thing because a complete three year, four year degree program cannot be delivered with a handful of 10 to 15, 10 to 15, 20 odd faculties, right? The student need to get that exposure, need to get that live project, need to get that internship and placement opportunities. So technology, when I speak from a higher education, it's not only from academic learning experience, it's from the from the start of a inquiry from a student or a parent going into an admission cycle to the academic delivery. Technology is going to disrupt, it's just disrupting. The pandemic has given that push and thrust to the universities and institutions to build up and accept that uh, that disruption because it's going to uh, because blended learning is going to stay forever. And it's going to be a blessing in disguise. And we cannot uh, move away from it because it brings, brings a lot of benefits for the students learning, right? Being from the mentor perspective as well. And as uh, rightly uh, said by uh, Mr. Ronak that one nation, one campus is a wonderful thought process wherein every, uh, every student coming from every single new corner of India gets the opportunity to get the same level of education and same quality of faculty so that they can keep on the on on the journey and while we have been doing right so to to, to ensure that when the student is spending all over almost three to four years in the campus they are getting those skills so considering that we launched a platform called my coach so it's like a personal 
my coach for each and every student for the degree programs so currently we are around 2500 students right so in this program we know for when a, when a student is in, a, in, a, in first year in second year third year fourth year what are their needs or the, what are the ancillary courses or certification need need to have as per their discipline stream so that they become their 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 exposure to the industry what is happening what is required what kind of a skill set they need to develop they get acquired while doing that curriculum apart from what they are uh, they are learning as part of their degree program as well so that's how we are trying to trying to capitalize on the technology infrastructure technology capabilities disruption so that we bring in the exact what is required for the students and the employability gap right that 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 narrows down narrows down right currently is around somewhere around 1.8 percent engineers coming out getting employed right so we want to bring, uh, broaden that funnel the, the the greater the input the greater the output should be that's our vision and we are working towards that and 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 the main part we are trying to do is that we are creating these curriculum with the industry partners right so if i'm creating a course in blockchain i'm partnering with relevant people we are organization working in blockchain and creating that curriculum implementing it so that students are getting the hands-on experience right and to deliver uh, the hands-on experience we have integrated all the virtual labs being in AIML, being in iot being in uh, entire miro platform for design students so that's how we have developed that infrastructure developed that capability capabilities on a platform and it's equal and uh, same for all the students across our universities so yes, in terms of challenges that I foresee, uh, uh, the, the biggest challenge that we foresee is that in terms of awareness about what, uh, what career opportunities uh, students and par parents needs to be aware about what is happening in the city. So a lot of exposure needs to be done. So recently uh, to do this, we did a, a school ambassador innovation program with Ministry of Education, uh, where we did a, a education program of 40 hours for 40,000 uh, teachers coming in from CBSE, NCRT, AICT, ICSE uh, schools, and we and we uh, made them um, ambassador innovation so that they when go back they go back to their school they talk about what are the career options for the student they become a they have been given a badge badge by Ministry of Education so uh, the 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 thought process needs to be inculcated and developed from the twelfth class itself so that students get to know what is actually happening what are the career opportunities that down the line ten years. So that's how we're trying to build up the entire ecosystem. So uh, this is from my side. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Nitesh. Thanks for that input. And uh, you know, I would uh, now come to Narayan Madhavan, who is actually uh, contributing in terms of bringing the right set of skills to the graduates who actually come out. So Nitesh, while you deliver the degrees and uh, enable students to learn more while they are still uh, pursuing some other stream. These students come out and they still have a gap uh, in terms of their skill sets as, as uh, in terms of what the industry requires. So Narayan, I think you have been uh, running this lab to train and bring the students up to date on what the industries need. It will be lovely to hear some thoughts from you on this. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to you all. I think uh, good views from all of you. Uh, uh, you know, I'm Narayan. I'm the founder of Bridge Labs. We are an employability pl uh, platform. Uh, our belief is uh, that, uh, you know, uh, we all know that uh, by 2030, according to McKinsey, uh, you know, India is going to produce 120 million uh, workable, uh, 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 workable man, uh, man resources, right? And uh, employability is a huge, huge factor. And uh, for us, employability means it's not just uh, skilling, right? Skilling, classroom, curriculum, training, trainer, I think uh, we personally believe this occurs to the uh, whole employability thing. Uh, yeah, so, so according to us, employability is that you're able to skill and take them to direct employment. Skill to job is what we believe in. So any, any, anyone who comes in to our platform, any job seeker who comes into our platform, it's 100% employment guaranteed. So first thing that we do is that uh, you know we have an uh, uh, AIML algorithm that is running on them to understand that what kind of a job they are suitable for. On the other end, we work with the industry and get the mandate from the industry directly, and then we marry the uh, job seeker to the industry mandate, skill them whatever gaps they have, and take them directly to employment. So 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 we are the only platform today in India that claims that does 
hundred percent employment uh, to to all job seekers. At the same time, making sure that uh, the uh, the you know the employer mandates are getting fulfilled. So my my take in all of this is that you know uh, COVID has uh, you know I'm now going to take a very uh, contrast view right uh, to 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 all the panelists here. Uh, you know what covid has done is uh, uh, many many good things covid has done as ronak has pointed out that you know uh, now an industry uh, uh, and an education institute can focus on what they their core uh, uh, core core areas of specializations are they need not specialize in all and they can all come together and offer offer course to an individual right so that is one thing that uh, that this covid has done Second thing the COVID has done, according to me, is that uh, uh, since uh, work from home has become a norm, it has allowed the industry, uh, uh, you know, the the industry workforce, to come and be a practicing mentor to a live course, right? Uh, that brings in a humongous industrial experience to a particular coursework. Third thing, I think, uh, if we can bring in more experiential, 100% experiential learning rather, uh, to all our curriculum activities. So it starts with problem statements. The learning is done through problem statement, right? It would do a humongous good to the whole industry. So, you know, uh, my belief is that, you know, we need to uh, embrace, uh, and I think the whole industry, the education industry, the ed tech industry, and uh, practically, you know, the, the, the whole community have come together. It is important to take the advantage of this. And rather than looking at a faculty, uh, curriculum, classroom, content based, look at content, right? You know, we have uh, MOOC content available from MIT, right? MIT, Harvard. How many people actually take that MOOC content? 75% drop out the day one, even before even they take the first class. What is the use of those MOOC video contents, right? Uh, self paced learning, I am not a big believer. Right, if self-paced learning was there, there is so many open educational resources available. Our, uh, you know, our, uh, you know, our uh, students should be able to embrace and get it. No, there is a guidance needed. There is a guidance, and uh, you know, a live classroom is needed, right? And here, if we can bring in the industry experiences to the classroom through project-based, I think that will do a great good. Uh, to the number of uh, you know uh, uh, students that we have, and we are bringing them to workable uh, uh, area, right? We are going to be uh, you know surpassing China by 2030, uh, and if we can really make them employable, I think we are a superpower by itself, right? So so uh, yeah, so I think uh, you know the it's the right time, uh, the you know the, and we all are coming together, the right mindsets are coming together. I think it's going to help. As we go forward yeah thank you thanks narayan for those thoughts and uh, that uh, in effect we are already drifting towards the core theme uh, of employability and uh, using innovation for making sure that our higher education graduates actually become employable because that is a core concern i was just looking at some statistics uh, uh, set out by this uh, uh, market research agency called statista right. which Saying that more than 16, 17 percent of postgraduate people are unemployable yes. and unemployed, and you know, so this is an area of concern. Dr. Desai, you know, uh, with your stellar record in the education sector, uh, I would request your views on what do you think? Uh, how can we use technology innovation, given the context set by Narayan and Nitesh and the other panelists? What do you think uh, we can do to make uh, use of technology to ensure that our students who come out become more employable? from the university perspective. Yeah, yeah, I understand uh, a lot of everything was discussed uh, regarding the workplace skills and uh, online courses acting as uh, a career resources and all that. The point is uh, a curriculum also plays a vital role. So we, we cannot always talk uh, university as a separate entity and the edge tech company as a separate entity. So the point, because I had interacted with many students who have taken online courses also. The point is, uh, uh, there has to be a kind of a handshaking uh, a process between uh, this academia and uh, industry. And, uh, and they, they should sit together and change the way the curriculum is designed. 
For example, I am also teaching artificial intelligence. I am unable to motivate the students to take up artificial intelligence because we, we as a faculty never know uh, what is the application. Exact application areas, uh, many of the faculty members will not be aware of that. Even machine learning, even IoT, self-driven network. Suppose if I take a subject or if we allocate a subject for final year students on smart cities, the one smart city subject is enough to motivate them as it includes all self-driven networks, IoT is there, and why artificial intelligence is there, why data center is required, uh, how a, a layman's life will become more comfortable with the smart cities and all that. In that way, we never think. We always think as a subject and leave it. So application part thinking first on the application and then developing a syllabus. So that is the need of the hour, I think, at this moment. Uh, can can I second to that, Dr. Desai? I yeah, think, yeah, please. I think you have you have said amazingly right. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think somewhere you know uh, we should uh, take advantage of the of the COVID scenario, mm -hmm. right? And uh, and uh, you know there are so many uh, industry uh, you know experienced uh, people are available. We should exactly. figure out a blend between uh, what the academia has to offer and the practicality of the industry by bringing them on into your live courses to get that live project experiences right that is what is going to become a differentiator because that's what is going to motivate them right this, uh, is, this, this is being discussed uh, this being discussed since 15 years right so they should come on a single uh, common platform and then both has to sit and uh, design a curriculum that is not happening again they take companies are there on their side and university and who has to come first yes that, that has so, always remained so I, will, a, I will like to add here. so the as i spoke in the initial brief so that's the way we are doing we are bringing the industry partner uh we are creating that designing what is required so uh, if i talk about uh, aiml or a blockchain so what is actually the practical application and to work on the practical application what all the, uh, a student in a higher education needs to learn so we are creating that curriculum with that industry partner then getting validated by the university partners and then finalizing the curriculum because that is the need of the r and exactly. and and having 250 corporate coaches is the only intent when they start interacting with the students from the first year second year the exposure to the industry is very very much essential for them they tend to learn a lot from them they get a lot of live project opportunities working on the hands-on application then getting an internship opportunity that's how we are creating an entire life cycle for a student and that is very very much required yeah nitish can i can i add one thing to the whole edtech industry they should sure, have sir. something in the game on the outcome right absolutely what is the percentage outcome like even let's take coursera right uh, right let's take any of them right what's the percentage of outcome that job they are finally getting into so what is the use of saying job readiness or practical application when the outcome itself is not achieved so, so we are so, so we are we are I, delivering. I, might be doing it but i'm saying i'm i'm saying as a broader perspective right uh yeah, yeah. now so we, so you're talking see, about machine learning or blockchain no Is i'm saying capable of doing machine learning or blockchain should no. we have a way to select them into the program to say what is your caliber can we can i deliver you to that job if you are coming in for machine learning course that kind of a work is not being done if you are so allowing that, that's that's and that's, that's why that's why we are so Naranji, that's why we are the, the unique people who are doing this embedded degree programs, right? Wherein we go put in our own faculties into the university campus. They work with the dean and the, and the administration staff of the of the university. They work in hand in hand, and from from a first day of the degree program to the final placement is being taken care by Imagine XP along with the university partnership. That's the trust and empowerment needs to be in each other's hands to execute it. Absolutely. I think here we should keep it generic because I know that, you know, what is the institution we should do? What's the ed tech should do, right? What as a platform to produce employability should do that? That's the important focus. And we should take each other's learning and see how Absolutely. we can do a better, a better job at it. Right. Uh, because the pie is that we eat, right? Uh, Absolutely. Million students are coming in, right. And if we are able to make in, make them employable, Right, that is that is a humongous opportunity for every one of them, right, to to do that, and good for the nation too, right, if it can get it done. Yes, synergies needs, needs to be found. Absolutely. Uh, can I come in? Uh, I agree yeah. to that because I am from the industry side, as rightly pointed by everyone. 
right so when we also discuss internally in our company right how do we enable this so because we go for campus recruitments so what happens is do we get the right students who are really good for us to build the innovations what we are looking for right so when we look at we come up with something known as educational services as rightly pointed out by nitesh that what we do is we go to the colleges or the universities we say that these are the things which we want to like to do and we provide the virtual labs we provide the train the trainer i know that is not sufficient to bring it to the employment stage but what we want to start is a small so that they start learning about uh, the basics of ai they start learning about what is the world is looking for from the ai and ml right in terms of the apps they can integrate uh, together using api technologies right and also having a lot of security which is important in terms of how they can build that so there are a lot of educational services what we bring in we bring in the virtual labs we bring in the trainers and industry speakers to talk to the college students and give the classes and so enable them and make them uh, like become passionate and enthusiasm to bring in to see what they can look at from what technology they want to drive so these are some of the initiatives what every industry is taking and we are also taking and we have gone to certain colleges and done that already and we are also working with our educational team for other rest of the institutions how we can make them uh, actually understand what the world needs what are the innovations what the industry is looking for what what they need to look at and uh, one little bit of practical experience hands on experiences and hearing from the industry legends talking about this technology so i just wanted to leave this so that add yeah. on to that right our yeah. belief is that trainer right bringing in trainer train the trainer itself is a curse right it has to be like you know you, you know you look at uh, law right there is apprenticeship right chart accountancy there is article ship look at chart, uh, you know uh, you look at uh, you know any of those right in medicine there is residency if you cannot bring the practicing uh, yeah, folks into the uh, into of uh, in, yeah. with the faculty into the course you're yeah. not going to be successful yeah, you know exactly. infosys so, has done train the trainer of uh, no no train, bring the trainer in the sense of lack uh, hear me out close yeah. to a lack of them along with nascom in 2006 and 2007 only 3% of them actually graduated, uh, you know, uh, passed after that the Infosys did the train the trainer. So train the trainer is not the way to solve the problem, right? Absolutely. Uh, the trainer concept itself is not the way to solve the problem. How do we get the industry to the academics? Into the academics. Yes. Is, yeah. is a way to solve the problem. I, 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 I do not think the other way around. Yeah, I would request Ronak Singh to share some thoughts on this. Yeah. I've, I've uh, observed, I think all the panelists speak and I can see uh, exactly what probably is one of the concerns and I've noticed and uh, you know experienced this myself the past 15 odd years that I've been working with the universities that I do work with. The academic community has a very strong opinion about industry. And when it comes to, let's say, things like employability, I think, and I think they are right to some extent, the academic community know that they are, so their job is not to make people ready for jobs. Their jobs are to nurture young minds, give them the learning that they require so that they themselves can then train themselves for whatever jobs are there in the future that they may want to do. Frankly, as somebody from the engineering background myself, I believe in that very, very strongly. If I had learned, let's say, AI, ML or other stuff that is, again, in vogue today, as my core courses in my engineering, I would not be able to do the unlearn, relearn bit that I need to do today. So frankly, when uh, if you ask a professor or an administrator at a university, they would tell you the same thing, frankly, that uh, their job is to prepare the young minds for the future. And yes, of course, industry has to up its game. Instead of coming in last minute, picking the best and brightest and saying that this is the lot that we take for campus, they should put some skin in the game to borrow a phrase from uh, one of the panelists and probably again I think and this would everybody would probably agree with embed some of their own people into the system and from year one onwards perhaps and, and I'm not necessarily saying that we'll make it a degree program that includes those people by mandate because I also do understand that the students need to be trained to look beyond credits today you put any course out there, as long as it leads to a degree, they'll pick it up and then they'll later complain about not getting a job associated with that degree. 
So they have to look beyond the credits. So once a student enrolls in a university, a healthy practice would be to have a steady stream of people coming in from the industry, teaching on campus or live virtually, and the students doing and going through those classes, whether they get credits for them or not is of course up to somebody else. But, and so that once it's, you know, year four, they are more or less ready for those jobs that they will now get interviewed for. You can't do that last minute thing where, uh, and I know plenty of universities and institutions that do that. Six months before the campus interviews, they send their kids off to some sort of training program where they are taught some of these uh, courses. And they expect that those kids will themselves now get picked up on campus by some of the companies that interview them. Uh, so some of them Ronak, may, may make it, yes. So Ronaki, I would like to add here. So uh, what our uh, thoughts thought is that when we are designing those credits, right, start from bringing from the first year curriculum, those credits should be shaped in such a way the students when spend their three to four years of program, they are getting job ready, they are getting skill within the as part of that credit, credit system. Because uh, I'm saying on the facts which we have proven, 80% of the students who are getting internships are getting pre-placement offers, right? So that is the power of the academics, power of the curriculum and the pedagogy, right? If the credits are put into the right system, right way, uh, uh, based on what is required in the industry, the success and the ROI will come for the students and their parents. No, I appreciate that, but I was speaking on a broader, bigger picture level where you could talk about other courses and other subjects, the sciences, pure sciences, you could talk about uh, courses like biochemistry, you, not just IT and computing, you could talk about mechanical engineering for that matter. And uh, frankly, a lot of these uh, subject areas are ignored by the edtech industry, we all know that. There are some of them which are totally not doable. Uh, we can't do a lot of these labs online. And hence, uh, at least the software-based uh, edtech firms or the uh, online edtech firms shy away from doing them. Practical, understandable. But industry as a whole, the employers, they have to recognize that this uh, stream of future employees or associates that they will hire are critical to their business plans. And if they're going to be a little bit uh, farsighted, they should get their act together now and involve themselves in the initiative that is to train these people early on, not at the last moment, not after hiring Absolutely. them and taking them off to a campus program where they will put them aside for a six month period and train them all over again for themselves and then complain that these kids were unemployable when we got them, but we did what we did. Uh, that frankly is, uh, let's say, uh, it's the ungentlemanly thing to do. It's not a politically correct word, but for the lack of a better one. So uh, it's time that the industry got its act together, got involved, I think, and more so now because the academic community is now ready for it frankly. They've gone through that year, year and a half of having done these lectures online, having struggled with some bits of access, like Sir rightly pointed out, Professor Desai, Dr. Desai rightly pointed out. And now they are open to the idea of some of these uh, industry professionals, uh, if I may use that phrase, uh, coming in and teaching some of these courses online, as long as students get the benefit of the experience. Frankly, if you look at the university experience in in a bifurcated manner. University provides three things. One is it provides you with the learning, the second, the community, third, the certification. And all three need not be done by the university itself. University does not take responsibility for the community, for sure. The community builds itself around its own body. Uh, certification, yes, definitely is the university's job. The learning, probably, if I recall my days correctly, half of it happened maybe a little less than half happened inside the classroom. Most of it happened outside the classroom. So uh, academic uh, community is ready, as far as I can see from my conversations with them the past few months. It's up to the rest of the industry to step up and offer solutions that make sense, that do not come across as nearsighted and uh, you know short-term fixes to Absolutely. a long-term problem. Uh, completely in agreement with Ronak. I think uh, uh, at the same time, you know, I, I've been in the industry, not with the university at all, uh, right? There is always a feeling that there is a lot of bureaucracy among the uh, 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 among the academia. If you get in there, the speed at which you want to change things, you want to execute things, uh, really do not happen, right? So we need to figure out a way where uh, where where where, uh, where the bottlenecks are removed, 
in 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 effect that ecosystem is getting created that pool is getting created which is beneficial to all but uh, i agree but i think uh, uh, so i agree with that bit of yours where the red tape is uh, kind of a culture shock especially if you're coming in from the corporate world but uh, that's what it is and you have to learn to deal with it and uh, let's not paint all of them with the same brush professor yeah. i would vouch for it as well uh, yeah, yeah. there are my point is we, my point is because of this nep 2020 uh, 2020 and all that a lot of autonomy is there right now and right. and we are also in the competition every university is in a competition with other university nearby so therefore employability everybody wants actually because definitely we accept we are on the receiving side earlier also i had this problem but right now with one example uh, digital marketing our faculty cannot teach for the final year students i arranged a digital marketing subject by a nearby uh, for, from gurugram is nearby to my place and uh, one person was coming all the 120 were were regularly attending the course okay. so these these experiments we are now we are doing we are doing with the data analytics also next semester i want to do a experiment so oh, uh, nearly 50% of the subjects we want industry person to come and teach okay. very very practical way of thinking and we have told all our faculty members it is not that uh, now you have been sidelined and all that it is a question of survival yeah i also agree to it because um, in our conversation also we experienced that the academicians from the university has become far more flexible in terms of thought process they have started listening okay what changes needs to be brought in and 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 they abide by it and I, i and there are some cases where there's lot of resistance resistance and friction comes out but i think 80% of the cases uh, we have found that the things are moving in the right direction for the welfare of the students the point is now in this nep 2020 lot of flexibility is there in the courses for Absolutely. example a 3 year course is there the student can leave the first year there is a exit point in every year every year so yeah, after first year if he is not satisfied he can leave the first year and he can get a certificate you know at the end of the second year if he is not qualified uh, satisfied he can go out he get a diploma and at the third year you will get a graduate mm-hmm. so yes. my point is to hold them back to the university campus i i think dr desai what i hear is amazingly good i think uh, that's what uh, the industry wants to hear right uh, and uh, bring otherwise in... where where is my revenue then if everybody yes. a student <laughs> leaving the campus just by taking a certificate uh, from my university after second year he is getting a diploma and going away so where will be my revenue then so these universities are now understanding to the core depth and they expect industry to come for their help and we are always ready now now the survival has a different a different question earlier also we had a question on survival those those the nap is becoming autonomy is a word of course but now it has put us in a very big uh, challenge to run a university so employability if the boy is getting a job then he will stay up to 3 years otherwise why he has to stay with me You're right because every option is available to him absolutely so dr right. thanks i am sorry to interrupt i think we are running in the last uh, couple of minutes of this session uh, so I, i think we have arrived at a very interesting point of discussion where we we are talking of uh, what ronan ji said you know uh, enabling and uh, ensuring that the students are ready to be able to uh, you know absorb learn unlearn relearn but at the same time we have this uh, problem of the skill sets which uh, people like imagine xp or narayan are addressing parallelly because the students need to be updated on the latest technologies and uh, you know go out into the job market with the relevant set of skills uh, my last question to all the panelists will be we'll move uh, around would be uh, to request uh, dr and starting with dr desai is so given this context and the new education policy what would be a set of recommendations we could kind of uh, make to the government uh, to incorporate as a policy which can be then uh, replicated across all the universities to uh, yeah. take it home uh, yeah yeah i understood uh, when when the government make any policies obviously their reference will be to all the premier institutions but india is a country where there are more than 500 private universities and most of the students will be studying in the private university private university so whatever the content they develop online etc is again by iit professors and again it will be catering to the needs of a cream 
so here all together as far as the content is concerned we have a challenge the second part is that it infra so with the uh, available funds with the private universities we cannot ensure the it infrastructure uh, with a, a wider bandwidth and all that so uh, these kind of discussions we will be always taking up with the ugc many times but the uh, financial support by uh, the government of india to most of the private universities is the need of the hour of course the uh, whatever technology innovation is happening is happening at the research level most of the uh, research scholars are doing better with this kind of available technology uh, in computer science and all that but what we find is uh, technology innovations uh, can be geared up of course very comfortably uh, provided uh, we get a financial support uh, it it infra i don't uh, require anything for that but every student getting a laptop from government of india at least uh, can be my 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 good suggestion in this context thank you thanks sir so mr rajesh kumar since you are one of those who provide infrastructure services what would you suggest yeah. as a set of recommendations for the government yeah so as everyone talked about so what i talked about also is that we come we put the go to the colleges institutions right provide the services educational we train them and we also provide a lot of infrastructure so that students can have a hands on experience like this i said was talking about smart cities or it may be iot integration or it can be any application integration all those kinds of things what we feel is that if even as a private institutes or whatever the institutes they want to look at if government can also give some aid in terms of helping the industry so that we can put it together uh, different kinds of uh, solutions different kinds of trainings so that we can enable the students for the innovations what the industry is looking for and they are uh, capable of uh, coming out uh, whatever they have their studies in they have that exposure early in their college days so that they know what's happening and they can come out so if that combination can work together it will really help us to move further and uh, actually put together uh, the solutions and those kind of labs and virtual labs with the aid with the government and the industry putting together for the colleges that's what we like to do that thank you sir thanks ronak ji what would you say so uh like for the side mentioned uh the government does make a lot of policies for the top 10 20 30 institutions the eminent institutions probably the best thing that they can do or the government can do for the rest of the institutions is not make any policies unbundle them let them do what they see fit for the future of their students so for instance as i had already mentioned some concept of along the lines of a one nation one campus where you connected together you're free to recruit faculty use faculty from anywhere or even request faculty for that matter it may not be a financial transaction involved in that to teach your students from wherever they are whether it's online or if they want to visit for the summer or a term let them visit and teach students currently i'm sure you're aware that there are lots of uh, bureaucratic and regulatory aspects that would not allow something like that on a large scale it may be done as a guest lecture one or two of them but that's that you can't have an entire course being taught by somebody who's not a bona fide professor or associate assistant professor even if you did and at the same time dropped the number of professors that you had or did not up it according to the number of students next next cycle you would lose a bunch of points and slide down that scale as a university so there are lots of these small Uh, indicative uh, requirements or metrics that are counted towards an IRF and NAC that actually are counterproductive to the idea of opening up the campus, whether it's digitally or physically, to faculty members from outside coming in and teaching your students. So probably some thought into that uh, aspect, whether we should allow and uh, we should, in fact, whether we should regulate that to that extent where we prevent faculty universities from choosing who is going to teach the students. That uh, the labeling of these. Uh, Uh, professors as professors associate assistant phd required and it's required probably that could be set aside for a few courses extra a certain number of credits per program for instance second uh, experiments for instance like which i would love to see is an incubation lab in a university like sirs which as he mentioned in a slightly rural area but the lab is built to allow students to one learn the uh, 
skills that industry requires. And two, in today's day and age of work from home being the new normal, almost. In fact, even work from there for industry, maybe in the final year and there on, from there on, even as uh, students who have passed out, helping their fellow uh, alumni or future alumni learn the same skills, as well as working out of that lab for a company that may be based anywhere in the world, for all you care, Silicon Valley. So, uh, but frankly, as I mentioned earlier, that would require either a government's, uh, the, the government's firm support in terms of, and it may, may, may not be financial. It could simply be uh, in the form of government passing policy that would allow and enable institutions such as uh, SERS University, another university that we know of, to carry out these experiments without having to risk lose uh, their NAC ranking or score lesser points on their NRF. And in fact, they should be awarded for it uh, on the flip side. So uh, like I had said earlier as well, that there are plenty of administrators out there who have thoughts like these, who have these ideas, who want to implement them, but because they're working within a very rigid framework, somewhere along the line, uh, they get curtailed. We're hoping that the NEP and some upcoming changes in policy would allow for some more of these experiments to come to light. But uh, if we are going to, let's say, try and encourage any debate at the government level, let it be along these lines. Sure. Sure. Thanks, sir. So, Nitesh, you know, the, I think we have about a minute uh, for you and, and Narayan. So, what Mr. Ronak said was, uh, I think uh, one of the aspects of external faculty is something that is core to what you are delivering. How would you like, like that as a policy in terms of a regulated uh, structure? So, I will be very short and crisp. So, an extension to the NEP 2020, right? So, government should allow a lot of collaborations between the university, industry and edtech partners and every each and every delivery should not be expected from the university right so that is not at all possible so that is one of the one of the things which is a need of the art and secondly uh, we have uh, been pioneer in the design education as well so there should be a design education body uh, which can govern because it, like there's a aict for engineering and management for nb etc so there should be a design education body where the design as an education should be formalized recommendations from the industry can go on because the digital transformation that is going to remain throughout now for the next 2025 odd years, right? And more than that, the so design becomes and digital transformation becomes an integral part of the entire journey. So that should be there. So that's from my side. Sure. Thanks. So Narayan, I'll leave the last comments to you. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, again, a contrary view. I, I wish the government allows uh, industry to use their CSR fund uh towards allowing towards adopting a particular institution and uh, allowing their employees to be part of mentors in that particular institution and they can use their csr fund to do it this way i think and they can even employ the 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 the, the, the students coming out of that right and they, so they feel that their csr fund is effectively utilized I think, uh, you know, it's a very simple thing, but if we can done, it will be uh, grateful to, uh, to all. Absolutely. Great thoughts. So uh, with that, we have come to the end of this session. We have uh, got a stellar set of uh, thoughts and ideas from all the panelists. I thank all of you for joining this and we look forward to taking this ahead.